NASA um, significant incidents report that comes out every two years, and it's probably due to be updated in the next not too distant future. If you'll give me one, I'll make sure my office yeah, makes you can, a copy. And I, I can, it, it's, on, it's available electronically and I can send the link to you as well. The actual, uh, the, the um, safety uh, and mission assurance office actually prints these out. So for the engineers that like to carry around this, this is uh, the chart that talks about all the different bad things that have happened in, in space flight. And they're always a good lesson uh, especially for the human factors aspects of it. Um, yeah, so I have a few of those. And, I, and if you, anybody wants my business card and email me, I can send you uh, more material. I actually have a, a, a Dropbox file. I put all the space safety stuff. Some of it is commercial. Some of it is uh, a lot of NASA lessons learned. Um, uh, my name is John Clark. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, uh, incidents in spaceflight, risk of human spaceflight. Um, depending on the time, I may be able to shorten some of this. Uh, I have a pretty extensive review on all the other things in life that can kill you, just so you have a perspective of what spaceflight uh, can also generate. But if you have any specific questions or you want to go on my space safety uh, Dropbox file, have at it. Just as way of background, um, I was a naval officer. Uh, most of it in aviation or medicine for 26 years. I was at NASA here at JSC for eight years. I was a branch head for medical operations and a shuttle crew surgeon. Uh, I was also involved in the uh, spacecraft uh, survival investigation team that came out in 2008 with the Columbia uh, survival investigation report. And then most recently, NASA published a book called Loss of Signal, which was the aeromedical lessons learned. And that's available on the, uh, in, the, uh, in the electronic format, and you can also buy it, copy uh, with the government printing office. Um, I'm not sure where my AV guy went, so um, is there an alternative? I guess I can uh, put it on, do it on memory stick if you want to. I, I don't know if it'll work, but it's worth trying. Do you have a computer here yeah but this one he's got hooked up with his yeah well uh hold on let me ask her because she knows who the guy's name is we don't know who it is we left here to go get the it's always something you know we, we, we have this all advanced <laughs> technology I'm not gonna bring my computer. Do I need to bring it? In my in, well, I, uh, in the old days, I used to use view graphs uh, when you only had to worry about the bulb burning out. So <laughs> <laughs> they were really uh, always a challenge. Well, uh, does anybody have any questions before we start? Uh, what are your expectations? But you're now, uh, Dr. Clark. You you were here uh, as I was saying when we walked in the door. You and I were out there in Building 37 eons ago. Yeah. And um, and you're now at NSBRI. Okay, so yeah, where I am now is uh, I'm in uh, Baylor College of Medicine, and we have a Center for Space Medicine, and I teach there, and I'm also in the Neurology Department. I also am the Space Medicine Advisor for the National Space Biomedical Research Institute, which is a research arm for NASA uh, uh, Health and Human Performance. And uh, I, uh, only there part-time because I'm doing a lot of commercial stuff. I do advise for a number of commercial space companies. Uh, I was the medical director for Red Bull Stratus. I've got another uh, similar project ongoing as we speak. Um, also work with uh, Inspiration Mars, which is a long uh, Mars flyby mission. And uh, gosh, who knows? I've, I'm, I've got so many different irons in the fire, I can't always keep track of them. But I'm pretty busy in the commercial side, I think, suffice it to say. But you're still here in Houston? Yes. Uh, okay, so why don't we go ahead and uh, I'm going to go through this pretty quick. I will make this stuff available for you all. Uh, and uh, so you don't have to take notes. Uh, this is the outline. Um, Oh, I always like this quote. Uh, the only thing we learn from history is that we learn nothing from history. And I'm a big history buff, so a lot of the stuff that I do has to do with going and looking at lessons learned from history. 
These are the learning objectives. I'm going to just go through this real quick because we've got a pretty quick uh, uh, time frame. I thought it was going to be a two-hour class, and now it's going to be a well, little we bit. We have two hours for the, for the uh, room. I don't know how many people yeah. can take in two hours. Okay, so uh, these are, this is going to be the outline. We're going to cover a ton of different areas. Um, every year I kind of review how long we've been uh, in space. Uh, and we're up to probably 120 uh, person years in space. Uh, 500 plus people have flown in orbit. All the long duration record holders uh, are owned by the Russians. Uh, Sergei Krikalev, who flew uh, Mir and two ISS missions, uh, has 800 total days in space. There are, I think, eight people who've had over 500 days in space. And I think four people have actually flown one year missions or greater. Um, and the longest single mission is Valery Polyakov, who's a Russian physician who flew 14 months in space. I break the hazards of spaceflight down into, f into three general areas. We have the, the environment of space, we have the vehicle environment, and then we have the mission architecture. And those are different uh, things that can conspire to con uh, affect human performance and health. You know, obviously the space environment with microgravity, radiation, debris, the vehicle environment, all the things that are, uh, result from being in a closed loop life support system, and then the mission architecture, the things that we do to crew, such as make them work uh, long, long uh, hours, slam shift their circadian rhythm, uh, and then uh, various aspects. Um, so I was going to just briefly go into some high risk activities as comparison. Um, th these are some of the top risks for, with, with respect to con uh, activities that insurance companies charge more money for, like hang gliding, uh, uh, private pilot aviation, uh, mountain climbing, skydiving, uh, boating, motorcycles, et cetera, et cetera. And what you see there is that, um, you know, uh, some of these activities are considered high risk, but they're re relatively safe. You know, one death in a, over 100,000 flights for hang gliders, for parachuting, it's about the same for every jump, one in 100,000. But if you base jump, which is from buildings or antennas, bridges or earth, uh, low altitude terrain following, stuff like that, it's a couple of uh, times uh, more fatal. Uh, there's two ways to categorize risk. One is by uh, events or activity, you know, in other words, one, uh, accident per, you know, mission flown. The other way to do it is by participants. So, you know, if you look at something like base jumping where there's not as many people that do it, the, a fatality of one in 60 base jumpers. Uh, this last year there was 24 deaths uh, with base jumpers. Mountain climbing is another high risk activity. It depends on where you go. Um, these are deaths per 100 climbers. So this is by, based on the population. You know, if you climb Yosemite or uh, Mount Whitney in uh, California, you know, we're talking about one in uh, 10,000 who climb Mount Whitney. Uh, in uh, Yosemite, it's one in about four or 500. Uh, for the real serious stuff like Denali or Mount Rainier, uh, it's, it's in the order of one in 300 to, uh, or less. But if you go to the Himalayas, it's huge. Um, it's on the order of maybe one in 10 die going to the summit. That's pretty high. Uh, for K2, which is a little bit more dangerous, it's one in six. It's like a Russian roulette. Uh, you know, and one year on K2, almost o over half the people that went died. Uh, so that's playing Russian roulette with three of the six cylinders loaded. Um, We'll talk a little bit about flying because that's an area that when we compare risk in space flight, we have something to compare to. Um, the, the risk in commercial flights, part 121, the regular commercial airliners, uh, they're really safe. They have failures of equipment uh, in the one in 100 uh, million flight hours and they might lose uh, an aircraft in a, 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 in a million flights. So it's pretty safe. In military aircraft, one in 100, uh, thousand flights, so just an order of magnitude more risky. Uh, when I, I flew combat in uh, Desert Storm, uh, loss rates were one in 3,200 flights, missions. Uh, so combat missions increase it. And now we bring it up a notch, okay, what was it like in the really bad times? European theater, World War II, bombing missions, daylight missions, World War II, it was about one in 100. But early on, it was one in 25. Um, now, 
Uh, if you take the flight profiles that we've had uh, generated enough numbers to calculate risk from, we have the f uh, almost 200 flights of the X-15 program, suborbital missions, wing launch, uh, 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 air launch drop from a, a, a B-52. Uh, we had one fatal mishap and a couple of landing mishaps in 200 missions. So roughly one in, you know, half a percent, one in 200 flights fatality. We had 135 flights of the, of the shuttle in the shuttle program, two lost vi vehicles and seven crew per vehicle. Um, and then we have the Russian blunt capsule. We have, you know, well over 110 flights plus their progress, which is a similar vehicle. So they've lost two two vehicles in about 116. So we can generate a profile that looks about for uh, suborbital, maybe one in 200, for orbital between one in 70 to one in 100. So what that tells you is that the, f the loss rate for, for space flight, so for orbital space flight is about what the loss rate for a World War II daylight bomber crew in Europe was. Early on, it was one in 25. Challenger was the 25th shuttle flight when it went down. Columbia was the 113th. Um, and this was, a, this was a poster in the safety office here. And when I went by it and I saw it, I just about, you know, my jaw just dropped off. That is exactly what our mission loss rates were. So when I work in the commercial sector and I talk to folks, I tell them, hey, this is risky stuff. You know, understand your loss rate is about what a bomber crew in World War II faced. And it was so bad in, in the European theater operations that there were actually mutinies by the bomber crew. Uh, they actually were losing, they would lose 10% of their aircraft on every mission. That's the kind of fatality rates that we're dealing with. I won't talk too much about this, but it's not just flying in space that's dangerous, it's preparing for space. You know, we lost Apollo 1 on a ground checkout, no intention for flight, so it doesn't count as a flight mishap. A lot of, fire, a lot of fatalities in training. Uh, Russians lost a guy in water survival training. They lost Yuri Gagarin in an uh, in a, a aircraft uh, fatality, and we lost two aircraft and four crew uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the early space program. So, we can lose people in training and, and ground operations as well. I'll cover very quickly where do, we, where do we have concerns. And this is the rough area. If you look at that chart, you'll have the pre-mission phase, the launch uh, part, the early ascent, uh, rendezvous and docking on orbit, um, you know, and activities like spacewalks, re-entry, uh, descent, landing, and post-recovery. So those are all the things that we could potentially lose crew. And you'll see that in your, th this chart is not going to be something you're going to be able to see on the screen, but if you have a copy of it there, you can look at it. If you want, I can send you a, a JPEG file that's uh, 12 megabytes and you can blow it up. I actually have it blown up in my office. And what this tells you is, that all these little, uh, like the red uh, outlined yellow boxes are the fatalities, uh, and all these little things are things that happen, bad things that happen. Some are mechanical failures, many of them have human related factors involved with them. But what the point here is that all the loss of life in the U.S. and Russian side has not occurred in space, it's occurred in the atmosphere. It was either the, on the launch pad, during ascent, or during re-entry and landing. Because that's where the energy transfers are the greatest. You've got chemical energy going into kinetic energy, and you've got uh, kinetic and, poten and potential energy in the form of altitude that you have to d contend with uh, and transfer to thermal energy. And so those energy transfer regions during launch ascent, re-entry, and landing are where we've lost all the crew. But most of the time crews spend in orbit, particularly these long duration crews, um, ha that's where the time frame for things that can happen in space. And we'll go through some of these as representative examples. Um, I'd give another separate talk on crew survivability and escape systems. This talk is about how all the ways you can die in space, and the other talk, the companion talk to this that you unfortunately won't get, is about how do you uh, mitigate that risk, how do you reduce that, how do you keep crews alive when something bad goes wrong, and then 
These are the different things that you would do to address those different phases of flight. Um, I'll point out a couple of really great references. There's the uh, International Academy for the Advancement of Space, or Association for the Advancement of Space Safety has a book called Safety Design. They have one for space operations. They also have a, a, a commercial spacecraft guideline. Uh, these are two, pro, uh, two reports that I had, uh, was involved with, the Columbia Crew Survival Investigation Report that came out in 2008. And then this one just came out a couple of maybe a couple of months ago called Loss of Signal, the Aeromedical Lessons Learned from Columbia. Um, so let's get right into it. What's our biggest risk? Uh, you know, before we start, uh, the flight is the launch pad. Um, and these are all the various uh, health threats. Uh, you've got things that are too hot, things that are too cold, debris, toxic fumes, uh, fire, uh, falls, etc. Um, the very first uh, loss of crew or lo loss of, of people occurred in 1960. This was before the manned flights that Yuri Gagarin and the Vostok series uh, uh, underwent. It occurred in 1960 when they were testing a new uh, booster, the R-16. Niederlein was the uh, commander of Soviet rocket forces, and uh, he uh, combined two things that we know do not work well together. One is having dignitaries and schedule pressure and having testing and launching a new system. And so he made a cardinal error. This is so re uh, replete with human error, it's almost shocking. But what happened was they were working a vehicle problem and uh, they, they were actively working it while they had uh, visiting dignitaries. They were trying to launch on an anniversary of a, one of the Bolshevik revolutions or, or whatnot and uh, they, they committed a fatal flaw. They didn't detank the vehicle when they were working on it. Detanking means defueling it. So you have all this, you know, you, in this case they use li liquid oxygen and, and uh, kerosene, you know, RP1. Uh, they, they decided, well, that's going to take time. We detank it. We're going to waste time. We want to launch. Pressure, pressure, pressure. Boom, boom. What happens is they uh, inhibit the first stage but as they're working on it, the second stage timer starts to count down. And it ignites while there's a, a, a huge number of people on the field, including General Needlein, who died in the blast. 74 people are killed uh, from the fumes and the fire. And then later, uh, another 48 people die. Here's a video of it um, that actually, uh, yeah, I don't know if they're sounding. I, all you're going to hear is people screaming and running. But, but basically, uh, when this thing cooked off, there were people everywhere. Now, the Russians still, to this day, let you people walk around the vehicle uh, with cigarettes. And we look back on that and just go, oh my god, are you kidding me? Um, so anyway, that was the first loss of uh, life that occurred. And we learned from that, uh, you know, follow procedures, don't have dignitaries there, put in schedule pressure when you're trying to work a problem. Uh, and press, you know, and, and do the right thing. Uh, this is a, uh, so now the next phase is a launch pad where there were crew on board. This was Soyuz T-10. Uh, they put the A on the end when it, after the abort and launched another T-10 uh, several weeks later. In this, uh, 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 Vladimir Titov and Gennady Strakalov were in the Soyuz capsule and they had a launch pad fire and this was a very interesting one because they had multiple means to try to initiate a launch abort system, and all of them failed except for the one commanded by Mission Control, and it took a while for that to finally happen. And what you're going to see here is the, uh, this is a video, this is a shot of, from Mission Control. The Russian generals are watching it. They see this thing go off. They think that's the vehicle. It's the launch escape system firing. Here's the, here's the video. And uh, the fire is consuming, there's a fuel leak, the fire is consuming the launch pad. They realize something is very amiss. The, the onboard detection system, the emergency detection system, failed to, to trigger because the wires burn. So they had to do a command initiated abort uh, sequence of the launch escape tower. Now you see the launch escape tower fire just as the fire consumes the vehicle. Uh, it, it is amazing footage. Um, there goes the launch escape tower. Same, as, same system that's used on the Soyuz to this day. There are the Russian dignitaries watching it, and they don't realize that that's not the vehicle that's taken off. That's the launch escape system. Very robust system. There's a backup uh, 
for a launch pad or early ascent abort, and that, and that system has actually been, been, been tested. Uh, there was another, uh, so that was in uh, 83, in 1975, earlier on, uh, they had a breakup during ascent, and this was, uh, this actually is footage of another one, I didn't have the actual footage. This was Soyuz 18. Um, the launch escape system usually is jettisoned after first and second stage separation just like on the Apollo capsule and on the Mercury capsule. So this was a, a, a staging separation problem between the second and third stage. The launch escape towers already uh, come off, so they don't have that means of escape. And what happened here was they had uh, pyrotechnics that stuttered. They didn't separate adequately. The vehicle uh, was carrying the second stage and the third stage engine fired, and basically the whole thing started to tumble and break apart. But because of the robustness of the design, the capsule comes, apart, comes off, its uh, descent systems, the, the uh, uh, drogue and, and pilot chutes uh, 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 activated and brought them down safely, actually right near China. And uh, then to make matters worse, the vehicle lands on a mountain and it, and it starts rolling down the mountain and actually almost went over a cliff when the parachute snagged a tree. So the point there is you're not safe till you're really safe home and, home at, home and safe, not just back on Earth. Um, the U.S. programs had a number of failures as well on the launch pad. Many of these are not necessarily well known. Gemini 6 was a very interesting one. I have a, do a whole talk on that because the crew, uh, the, 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 the uh, Gemini uh, Titan rocket uh, fired and then shut down because of a, a plug came out and terminated it. And the crew met the criteria to eject out of it, but they didn't. Uh, and they were able to re uh, recock it and, f and launch it a couple days later. This was a rendezvous between Gemini 6 and 7. Uh, there was a, a, a launch pad fire on one of the early shuttle flights. I, I uh, actually have a little summary slide of that. There was an abort of a, a main engine failure. The, the U.S. space shuttle had two solid rocket motors that would fire for two minutes and then they would fall away. And then the space shuttle main engines were liquid fuel, taking liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen from that big solid, the big uh, orange tank called the external tank, and they would burn for another eight and a half minutes. And there were three of those space shuttle main engines, and one of those went uh, failed, and they just burned, did a burn for a little bit longer. There was also a uh, center engine failure on Apollo 13 before the actual other problem developed. And then we've had a number of pad aborts uh, where the um, liquid engines, the space shuttle main engines fired five seconds before, they usually fire about five seconds before the solid rocket motors, and that they, were, they fired, but then there, there was a termination because of event sequence failures. So you had the liquid engines fired, and the solid engines didn't fire, which was what was supposed to happen. And there was a great quote by uh, Steve Hawley on one of those aborts. He had a couple of these, and he said, boy, I thought we'd be a lot higher at main engine cutoff. It's a great saying. This was the launch pad fire that raised a lot of concern. This is the 12th shuttle flight. Um, they had a liquid hydrogen fire, uh, which is uh, liquid hydrogen burns. Uh, you know, hydrogen burns, you know, it's very hard to see, so they could tell by thermal readings, but they uh, ended up having to put uh, infrared cameras on there afterwards because the regular cameras didn't see the fire, but they fired this, the uh, uh, water suppression system, but this fire burned for 12 minutes. Now, the crew had an option, and there was a lot of discussion in the mission control uh, crew uh, arena as to whether they would do a pad abort. You know, there are four abort modes uh, that they could do. A, a mode four would have been where they get out and go down the slide wires and escape, and they decided we're going to stay inside the vehicle. Unfortunately, that was the right decision, but it could have ended up really bad. 1986, uh, late January, very cold launch day, Challenger accident occurred. Most of us you know, uh, who are my age remember that, but for you guys that are, you know, born in the 80s uh, or, or 90s, you don't remember a Challenger, but it was a huge issue for the, the whole nation. And um, what happened here um, was the, the cold temperatures caused the O-rings that were uh, used to seal the solid rocket motor joints together uh, f were, were cold and they didn't have the re normal resiliency. And so what happened is those, those O-rings uh, leaked and uh, caused a burn through uh, of one of the solid rocket motors. The burn through caused the strut that held the solid rocket motor to get to fail structurally and then it tipped over into the external tank. 
And what you see here uh, is often mis erroneously called the, br the shuttle exploded. It didn't explode. It had an aerodynamic breakup. And what you see there is the uh, expelled liquid oxygen and hydrogen uh, uh, vaporizing, uh, but it never actually exploded from in a true chemical sense. What happened here is that uh, the cameras are tracking it on after launch, and uh, this video footage uh, was later available for analysis, but that is the uh, crew cabin, the forward fuselage and uh, the pressure vessel that the crew, the crew are in. Uh, it broke apart, and the uh, evaluation of that, you know, by magnifying it showed there's the nose cone of the shuttle, there's the forward fuselage with the uh, pressure vessel that the crew are in, and they're still alive. They're unconscious as they started to lose pressure. They didn't have a protective system other than a smoke hood, which was like a motorcycle helmet that fed uh, air, not oxygen, into it. And then eventually the capsule uh, attained a downward uh, aerodynamic velocity because of the trailing wires and the relative aerodynamic component of that. The crew was alive but unconscious until they hit the ground. Um, the vehicle broke up apart at a very low altitude, 45,000 feet commercial airliners fly that high, 60,000 feet, you know, U-2s, SR-71s, and spacecraft launch up at that height. Uh, so it wasn't, a t it wasn't an unsurvivable if you had the right equipment, particularly pressure oxygen, maybe even a, a, a pressure suit. The crew survived the breakup. We know that from the autopsies. And the other thing is that they activate, several of the uh, air packs that were found showed that they had been activated. So the crew recognized they were in a bad situation and they survived and, and activated it. But because they were only getting unpressurized air, not pressurized oxygen, they went unconscious. And then they succumbed to the impact forces on hitting the water. Um, I don't know if I'll have time to go through this one, but this was another mission that was it, it, it never resulted in a fatality, but it was this close. This was the Chandra X-ray Observatory uh, launched on uh, uh, Columbia in 1999. This was Eileen Collins' uh, mission as a uh, 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 commander. And I'll, I'll play the, uh, the audio from Mission Control because it is so overwhelmingly abnormal. We have booster ignition and liftoff of Columbia, reaching new heights for women in X-ray astronomy. So they have they have a fuel cell problem right off the bat. That's not good. They they were they're what powered the vehicle. That's caught uh, Altman, who was the Capcom in Mission Control, talking to Eileen Collins. Roger that, Columbia. Looks like we had a transient on AC-1. That's an uh, electrical uh, spike on the... Uh, Columbia's now headed downrange, altitude 3.8 uh, miles. And as we hear, uh, all systems uh, okay. It looks like a sensor on board. I love PAO guys. The masters of understatement. Columbia Houston, we are critical to AC2 on the center engine, AC3 on the right. We've lost DCUA on the center and DCUB on the right. Those are the control okay. systems for the gimbals that control the main engines. That was a, you know, that. So, so what happened here is they were having multiple uh, problems. They had a fuel cell problem. They had uh, uh, control systems that were controlling the, the gimbals and the main engines that were uh, reaching a critical limit. And what happened is they had two independent um, failures that occurred that were conspiring to stop this vehicle in flight. One was the multiple shorts that had occurred from servicing problems of the vehicle uh, and, and short circuits that were affecting the fuel cell, and the other was that they had a uh, they were they had an under th uh, uh, thrust from from the one of the uh, engines because of a foreign object debris that had torn a hole in the in the uh, the engine bell. The other problem they had was.
that they had, they had to have a waiver to carry a payload that would not have allowed them to land with the payload. Now ordinarily, you launch, uh, you know, even when you fly a vehicle, uh, say, say you fly a, you know, a, a long haul 747 or A380 to Australia, when you take off, after you take off, you can't land with that weight. You have to dump fuel for two or three hours to, before you can actually land again. So this vehicle had a waiver because it could not land with the weight it carried. Ordinarily, the Chandra would be, di would be pitched out at payload altitude and they would be able to land the shuttle normally, but if they had an abort called a return to launch site abort, they had too much weight to land. John Young said, we never could land this thing, it would have torn the wings off because the wing loading was too high. So we have two failures on ascent that were conspiring to, to bring it down. One was the loss of thrust and the other was the control of the gimbals. And they had a payload that would not have allowed them to do a return to launch site. And here is, uh, here is the uh, debris uh, has torn a, a hole in the, in the uh, center engine. You can see a streak coming out of it. Here's a view of it uh, during the uh, ascent. And then the post-flight analysis uh, showed this hole in the cooling veins of, this, of the engine where a, a piece of a plug came out and tore, tore, up, uh, tore up the engine during the turbulent launch phase. That's why they pay so much attention to FOD. Even a little piece of anything out there can tear a hole in that engine bell. So that was one of those things that we missed it by this much. If those center, if those engines had shut down because they lost control of the gimbals that controlled their, uh, con their uh, uh, direction, the engines would have shut down and the only option they would have had would to do a, an abort return to launch site and they couldn't because they were overweight. Um, here's a, just a quickie one on commercial, in the commercial sector. This was during one of the qualifying flights for the X Prize uh, on, on Spaceship One. And I'll show you the video. There's a lot of human factors involved in this, and they're, they're working uh, to try to rectify this. But what you see here in this video, uh, you have the captive carry in the mothership. They, they're dropped off about 45,000 feet. The boost phase occurs when the uh, uh, butyl rubber uh, nitrous oxide engine fires. And what happened here was a, a multitude of things. They had asymmetric thrust uh, because of the ablative nozzle burn and also because of unloading of the um, uh, stick. And so what happened is this vehicle goes into an uncommanded roll of about, about 30 RPM. And you could see in the video inside there, even though that's you know, a, a, a roll you could do in an acrobatic aircraft, uh, inside that vehicle you're tumbling around and it's very disorienting. So that was one that, you know, we learned a lot from, but nothing, you know, bad happened. Um, we've also had a number of other scenarios where we lost vehicle control. I won't go through all of these. Some of these are mechanical failures, and some of these are purely human-related. Um, I'll talk about the Gemini uh, uh, 8 was a, uh, was, a, was a mission that uh, Neil Armstrong, in particular, shown like... Uh, uh, you know, uh, he just, he did a great job in, in uh, uh, adapting to the situation and recovering it, and some of that may have contributed to him being selected as the first person to walk on the moon. This was going to launch uh, and rendezvous with an Agena target vehicle. The rendezvous and docking was a big part of the, of the Gemini program. Uh, what happened is the vehicle docks with, successfully with the, with the Agena target vehicle. In fact, you can... Uh, you can see that's, that's a, this is a view from the, the uh, Gemini looking at the Agena target vehicle and they come up and back into the rear end of this. They dock successfully and then um, during that time a very slow, almost imperceptible uh, roll started. At first they thought uh, the Agena has got a thruster that's leaking and it's firing. The roll got worse, slowly got worse and worse. You can see over a period of between the time they docked and the roll was about a half an hour and then uh, the, after 15 minutes they did an emergency undock and now the roll really went bad. Why is that? Because the problem was not on the Agena target vehicle, it was on the Gemini capsule. So this thing starts to roll at about 50 RPM. This is now getting to the point where the G-forces with headward and, flu and feetward fluid shifts is causing you know, a, a, a serious cardiovascular 
compromise problem so that the person may not be able to respond and more importantly um, it's very disorienting. So you can't even touch a switch because the tumbling action is so great that you, you don't have good sensory motor control. And uh, this is a plot of the, of the actual RPM rate. You can see here this is 300 degrees a second or about 50 RPM. That's pretty fast. I mean that would, if you did that in a free fall during a parachute jump, you would be very uncomfortable. Um, so what happened was they, were, they just started pulling circuit breakers and shutting everything down. And fortunately, uh, they had had training in this. That was, it shows the, the importance of training, but they had done one of those tumbling uh, trainers, multi-axis trainers, where they had to do certain things. And what they realized is, we don't know what's wrong, so we're just going to shut down everything. Um, when they did that, they got the roll, they, they shut the thruster down, and they were able to do, they had to do an emergency landing in the Pacific. Interesting thing was, the, the reason that, that this failure occurred was that the thruster failed on instead of off. What was the lesson learned there? That you want to fail to the safe mode, and a thruster failing on is not as safe as a thruster failing off. So virtually everything that happens in space, there's some lesson that's learned that can propagates and continues forever on afterwards. You wouldn't think, why, who would have thought building and designing something where a thruster would fail on would be a good idea, but it happened. This is another one of those cases where it's not very well known, but it's a very, uh, it's a very poignant example of the human uh, errors. And this was during the uh, Apollo 10, the final check out of the lunar module around the moon before the landing a couple of months later. Uh, it's uh, uh, Gene Cernan and Tom Stafford are in the, uh, uh, in the lunar module. They're going to go down to uh, uh, 10, I think it was 30, 40,000 feet. They didn't give them enough fuel to come back because they didn't want them to land. So they actually, they, they, they didn't adequately fuel the tank so they couldn't, if they landed on the moon, they couldn't have left. Anyway, this is the, um, this is the uh, 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 summary of that. Um, they, uh, the uh, descent, this is after the uh, descent module uh, is going to be separated. The descent module is what lands and then the, the ascent module takes it off the moon. So they're going to go and they tested this whole thing out. And, uh, Gene, and the, the lunar module was called Snoopy um, and um, Gene Cernan goes, okay, you ready? We're going to do the separation. They, do this, the, they, they get ready to do the separation and then the vehicle starts this uncommanded maneuver. Now, I went back through the transcript and Gene Cernan said son of a bitch throughout the whole mission. So it wasn't just <laughs> Because of this, that was he's a Navy uh, Navy pilot like I was, and you know we do cost a lot. But anyway, the vehicle starts to do this uncommanded uh, maneuver, and they have no idea what's going on there, um, and so they're uh, trying to figure out why this thing is has some kind of runaway thruster on it. And what it turns out, uh, I won't go through this in too much detail, but. This was a test of the Apollo guidance system. Who is, any MIT grads here? You know, MIT, the Draper, you know, Charles Stark Draper Lab, now Draper Lab was the group that built the Apollo guidance computer, and it is an amazing piece of technology, especially for its time. But it, they were testing two systems out. They were, had the primary guidance navigation system and the abort guidance system. And this is the Apollo uh, guidance computer, and right here, is the primary guidance and navigation system and the abort guidance and navigation system. And there's three positions for the switches. There's auto, attitude hold, and uh, there's off, the down position, attitude hold, the middle position, and up is auto. And they had been used to using the primary guidance system switch. And um, so they had routinely would put that in auto. But now they were testing the abort guidance switch. And, they're pr and they were supposed to have it in the attitude hold, the middle detent. Okay? And, and if you look at those switches, you know, there's a little bit of a pull up, but not as much as you perhaps would like, where you really realize it's two actions. And so what happened is, from what I understand in the, in the analysis of it, uh, one guy puts it in attitude hold, and the other guy 
puts it in the next, he thinks he's putting it in attitude hold, but he moves it from attitude hold to auto. So they're in abort guidance mode. One guy puts it to attitude hold, which is where it's supposed to be. The other guy reaches down and he puts it in the position he thinks it's in. And one moves it from off to attitude hold. The other guy moves it from attitude hold to auto. When it goes into auto, now it's saying return to mothership. Where's the command module? That's the, what the, uh, that was what that maneuver in auto was supposed to do. But, there, uh, the, but the command module is not where it's supposed to be. So this thing starts to fire and move all around trying to find the mothership. And it took a while for them to finally figure out, hey, man, we had it in the wrong switch position. So that's another example of switchology and human factors errors that can plague us. Now I won't pick only on the crew, the flight crew, but we also have times where mission control, which is where I used to work, can also contribute to the problem. This was early in the shuttle program, STS-32. Uh, the flight controllers who were under contract, they weren't NASA, a lot of the positions were not NASA, they were contract, and they had to work longer hours and they didn't have the same kind of constraints that the NASA flight that flight controllers had. This guy was working 12 hour shifts multiple days and he was dog tired. What happened? He, uh, he had, in, in, in this scenario, you try to offload the crew. Any of you flight controllers? Okay, so, so you, you know how much training you get and all this stuff, but the flight controller's job is to try to limit the amount of crew activities by doing stuff on the ground. So every day, for the shuttle, they would have to correct the state vector. The inertial measurement units would, uh, would get a, a, a bias error, and then you would put an, a correction factor in there to reset the inertial measurement units. You can do that by having the crew do the uh, uh, optical sight of a star. You could, have them, uh, you could have flight controllers do it by the correction factor. And so the, and, you know, the, always the option is to have the flight controllers do it, not the crew. So what happened is the flight controller is uplinking a corrected state vector that is erroneous. The computer says this is out of limits and rejects it. You know, it's a positive, excuse me, a positive sign where it's supposed to be negative or whatever. And so the computer rejects it. The flight controller goes to his damn computer and he, he continually tries to override it and the computer keeps rejecting it. Finally he figures out, he puts all his effort into figuring out how to override the computer's inhibits. He uplinks the state vector, which is erroneous. Now the shuttle goes into what's called an LOS period, loss of signal. The crew's asleep, they're in an LOS period, and the computer input to the guidance system now starts to say, hey, I'm not where I'm supposed to be, and it starts firing thrusters. Mm -hmm. So now it's in loss of signal, the crew's asleep, and they can't command it to go back to where it was. So for the 10 minutes or so that the LOS period had occurred, the crew is asleep, and the vehicle is just tumbling on its own, firing its thrusters because of a human error. Great lesson learned. After this, there was a massive effort that went into circadian shifting and understanding sleep, and there's still flight controller studies ongoing to better uh, improve the, the sleep quality for flight controllers. This is a great example of human factors error. This was a, another wonderful study in human factors. There's a great article. Here, if you want, I can email you a copy of it. Um, there, this was the uh, progress mirror collision that occurred in the uh, 97 time frame. Actually, there were two of these events. The, the uh, uh, M233 was a near miss, and M234 was a hit. So they had already tried this maneuver once and almost hit the Mir space station, but because of you know, mission control in Russia said, you got to keep trying this, you're, you're going to do this again. What was the driver? One was to save money. Instead of using an automated docking system, they decided we could save money by reducing our bandwidth and our dependence on the Ukraine's KUR system. Uh, so we're going to go with a, with a manual control system. The crew have to do this manual control. It's like flying an unmanned aerial vehicle you know, where you're in one vehicle, but you're flying it as with the visual imagery from another vehicle. Um, and there were a whole series of human factors. The, they slam shifted the crew, they didn't have adequate sleep, they weren't well trained in it, uh, over and over and over and over again. These things were warnings to the, uh, to the crew. Um, the other thing is that uh, 
you want to know where the vehicle is, how far away it is, and what's its closure rate. So you want to know distance and rate of closure. That's a kind of standard thing for rendezvous and docking. But they, because they thought the radar from the range rate system was jamming the video signal because the video signal was dropping in and out, they said, well, shut down the range radar. So now all they have is the visual rate. And what happens is, uh, that was the collision with the Spectre uh, solar array. Here's an actual video of it. This is a video from BBC called Mere Mortals. It has Mike Full talking about it. And this is a camera that's actually on the, the display in the mirror, and the mirror is buried down in the clouds. I don't know if you can hear any of this, but um, he's basically saying, I couldn't see where the vehicle was, I didn't have the range rate closure, and by the, they, they never did really get a good handle of where the mirror was. One of the things that the U.S. side learned was when you're doing rendezvous and docking like that is instead of having the vehicle that you're coming into being against the earth where it's harder to see is you have the vehicle out in space so it's, that's the only animate object out there. Um, so that was one of the lessons learned there. We'll talk a little bit about environmental effects. You know, we talked about v space vehicle effects. We've had a whole bunch of combustion events, a euphemism for fires, mostly avionic systems. On Salyut, which is the early Russian uh, space station program, Mir, space shuttle, and ISS. A lot of toxic environmental factors, including uh, high carbon, mon uh, carbon monoxide as a combustion event, uh, toxic products. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about some of these later. And we've also had water contamination. So a lot of these issues from... And that took about two days. This is Andy Thomas, who was uh, the, one of the last guys on Mir Space Station talking about one of the fires. You have nausea, a certain amount of confusion, invariably a headache because you're oxygen deprived. It's just a very uncomfortable feeling. So one of the issues with that was that it was a low temperature catalytic oxidizer that had uh, had a fire and, the, and they, f they analyzed it and think it was because the, the thing was configured wrong by the crew. So, you know, you can see human errors, you know, embedded throughout all these kinds of events and this is one of those examples. So we saw it with the mere progress collision, we saw it with this, this system, and then the previous slide showed Jerry Leninger who was on board when the uh, the uh, solid fuel oxygen generator uh, ruptured its canister and almost burned through the hull. This is one that, uh, another human error, and I'm not trying to pick on humans, but you know, any of you who are human factors engineers, you know that about 70% of mishaps have a human factors component, and that's not at all unusual when we look at these. In fact, if you went through this list and, and, and really dug deep in it, you would probably find human factors errors of at least 70% of this list as well. So that would be a great, you know, project or thesis. Apollo Soyuz test project. After the uh, separation from the uh, Soyuz, the Apollo capsule is coming down. It's got uh, uh, Vance Brand, Deke Slayton, and Tom Stafford. There's Deke Slayton, who was the head of the astronaut office. Uh, uh, Vance Brand and, and Tom Stafford in the middle. So they're coming down and they're following the vehicle systems like they always do and this is always the battle you have between automated systems and manual systems. How do you follow it and what, what's going on? What's, you know, what is the thing doing what I, what I want it to do? These guys are getting antsy. They, the normal landing uh, system, which follows a very precise se sequence of events, this comes after this and after this and after this, and it occurs during an exact time during the uh, altitude and uh, velocity regime of the capsule coming in. They're coming down and the crew's going, I don't know about this, I wonder if this thing is, wor is working right. It may be that they want to fly the vehicle because they're pilots, or it may be that they've misinterpreted some of the cues like where they are in the altitude velocity regime of the reentry capsule, but they decide, I don't like this, we're taking it out of auto. We're, we're, we are turning off the auto landing mode of the capsule. And they're going to go to manual mode. What does that mean? It means they now have to follow that precise sequence of, of switch throws at the right time, and they, and they miss one. And what happens is the capsule is coming down, the 
uh, capsule equalization port has been opened at the same time the thrusters are firing to try to dampen the capsule's motion under canopy because they did not follow the sequence. Now, that happens because of a variety of reasons. You know, you miss one little teeny line. And you, any of you ever written flight rule of uh, uh, checklists? You know, you, you look at those things, and if you didn't know exactly what they meant, it would be hard for you to follow them. But you take somebody who's been in space, they may have a little bit of the space stupids, they may have a little bit of motion sickness or whatever, but they don't follow that checklist in the precise manner, and what happens is a thruster is firing while the vehicle is open to the atmosphere. And that toxic fume, the nitrogen tetroxide, gets inside for just a short period of time. And after a while, they realized, man, you know, there's something wrong here, and they, they shut it off. But by that time, the capsule has already filled with enough of this very toxic material that they've, they've, already, been, they've already suffered a, a sequela from it. Then, to make matters worse, the capsule uh, lands in the water and goes un into the inverted position with the nose cone down, the heat shield up, and now they're hanging from the straps. Their, uh, their uh, personal protective equipment is above them now. They have to unstrap, they fall out, they have to climb back up and, and get the capsule, uh, the, the, get the personal protective equipment. One guy, uh, uh, Vance Brand, goes unconscious. Tom Stafford finally gets free, gets the, uh, the masks and puts them on everybody, and, and the capsule eventually flips over. And the, the uh, Hector, you, you've done toxicology analysis. You, have you, you guys have looked at this case, I'm sure. Oh, really? Well, it's a good one to look at. But anyway, these guys suffered a very, very severe chemical pneumonia, pneumonitis, from the nitrogen tetroxide exposure and were hospitalized in the ICU at Tripler Air Force, uh, uh, Tripler Medical Center in Hawaii for two weeks because somebody didn't follow the checklist. So the importance of human factors in checklists and when you decide to override a, an automated system that has been vetted, you better make sure that everybody follows the right procedure. And then this just shows you the, um, uh, Permissible exposure limits, uh, you know, were far exceeded the uh, acceptable levels of standards, and they were lucky that they ha got to them quickly and, and were able to uh, treat them uh, with a, 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 a intensive uh, critical care medicine. This is just a quick list. I won't go into any detail because most of you are not medical types, but what this shows you is all the different kinds of medical conditions that have occurred in active U.S. astronauts not in space, but here on the ground. Now this is despite a robust, extensive surveillance and screening program. I mean, literally, any of you have ever been through an astronaut selection? I mean, it's, you know, what do they say, tubes and something in every orifice. They scan you, they probe you, you know, you look at the movie, The Right Stuff. It's like that except worse. So these are medical conditions that would kill you if you didn't have access to ex intensive medical care. Pancreatitis, gastritis, uh, duodenal ulcer, uh, uh, urinary uh, uh, kidney stones, 14 kidney stones in 10 astronauts. Um, I mean, you name it, retinal detachment. Wow, you look at that list and you, these are in healthy screened astronauts. We're really lucky that stuff hasn't happened in space. But, oh, it has. And <laughs> the only reason that we haven't had them in the U.S. program is the majority of long-duration missions where you're going to be in a longer risk period of duration exposure has been in the Russian program. And so they've had three times where they actually abandoned the space station for medical problems, and they had three other times where they were in the process of abandoning the space station when the problem spontaneously resolved. I'll go through these just to point out the concerns that we have, is, and particularly on the medical side, about getting people off the space station. So we had a, a Soyuz 5, they had a, uh, a, a combustion event and severe headaches. The crew said, we don't want to stay here any longer. And there was a battle and they decided to come home a few days early. That same thing happened on the NASA Mir uh, program with Andy Thomas, but the crew, you know, sucked it up, didn't get oxygen, and have some health effects as a result of that. There was another mission uh, in the Soyuz series 
just before Mir where a crew member got a urinary infection. Men don't get urinary infections for the most part, but try to pee when you're on your back, which we had to do in medical school on the bedpan. You know, it doesn't work. The gravity helps, you know? And when you try to pee on your back, which is what it would be like in space, what happens is you don't empty your bladder. And when you don't empty your bladder, you end up with a potential for urinary infection. So guys, guys do not get urinary infections except when they have to pee on their, when they're lying on their back. And the third case was a case of a, of a severe uh, ventricular arrhythmia, which you can actually see on this, um, that occurred. Um, and uh, that, that is a kind of a, that was another early mission termination. And then these are the three cases that were close calls. One was a dental abscess. The Russian dentition has always been an issue. Uh, now we do a lot of prophylactic work on, on dental problems. This is a fascinating one too. This is the one uh, where in the later stages of the MIR program, the ethylene glycol, which is the primary coolant system, would leak and it would form, uh, it would collect. And what happens in space, it doesn't pool on the floor. It, it forms balls because of surface tension. So the commander, uh, Dejurov, was going through an unlit module in Mir, you know, really cool, it goes through the unlit module, his head goes into a ball of ethylene glycol. And now his head is like a fishbowl with ethylene glycol. It covers his face, it burns him real bad, and it gets in his, his mouth, and he has, starts getting severe respiratory compromise. And the only reason they didn't abandon the vehicle was that the guy, that w the U.S. guy was was Norm Thaggard, who was a U.S. physician. He says, hey guys, I don't even know if we're going to survive a, 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 an evacuation. Let's treat him with steroids. And he able, was able to re get this guy back in shape. And then the third case was a uh, acute abdomen. You know, this is when you, oh, my belly's killing me. You go into the hospital. They thought it was appendicitis. It turned out to be a kidney stone. And that passed, and they were able to avoid evacuating for that. Um, I'll talk a little bit on the psychological environment. Anybody with a behavioral health or psychology background. This is awesome stuff because, because nobody ever knows about all this stuff that's happened. It's amazing. This is uh, Valery Polyakov who spent 14 months on Mir and he spent five hours a day exercising and he spent the rest of the time looking at Mother Earth because it was so important to have that connection with Earth. Now what's going to happen when you go to the moon? The Earth is the size of your thumb at arm's length. It's still a pretty blue marble, uh, but now you go to the Mars, it's a pencil dot. It's no longer a pretty marble. It's no longer this beautiful vista. So the, the psychological comp uh, components are one of the top three risks that we think are going to face us for long duration missions. This was uh, photos in, in Valerie's sleep station of this family. Now we have these really cool pictures that show up randomly on, a, on each crew member's screen that shows them various you know, surprise uh, photos on their, on their laptop as screensavers, and that, that's a huge psychological boost. But you cannot, you can't even comprehend what this is going to be like when you go to Mars and you're, you can't abort to Earth, you're, you're at least uh, you know, six to eight months away uh, depending on where you are in the cycle. These are a list of all the uh, uh, events that have happened from a behavioral health standpoint. I won't talk too much about this. 1985, payload specialist uh, 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 Tracy Wang goes crazy because his payload fails. I have a whole talk on that. Uh, Dejirov, who is the same guy whose head went in the ethylene glycol ball, his mother died. Mission Control says, yeah, I don't think we should tell him. You know, we spend a lot of effort with our crew now saying, when do you want to know about something bad? You know, do you want to know about the dog, your wife, your kids? And they decide, I want to know right away. I want to know, you know, after I, you know, uh, you know things are settled down. We're not in a, a high crisis ops. But you don't hide things from people unless you've talked about it ahead of time. When he finally found out, he went into an acute withdrawal reaction. We've had, I've got the great videos of these things. Homicidal, suicidal you know, uh, mutiny, there was the Skylab 4 mutiny, there was the uh, Apollo 7 mutiny, there's the Jerry Leninger on Mir, Mir 5 mutiny. I mean, you, you, I mean, there was tons of these things. Fights, you name it. I won't go through Taylor uh, Wang's case. That's a fascinating story in itself and is why they started to put locks on the hatch because they were worried he was going to blow the hatch. And afterwards they quit the payload specialist flying for quite a while. Uh, this is a, a topic on, uh, from uh, Shannon Lucid. Um, uh, 
Even if the space station has the latest futuristic technology, if the crew members do not enjoy working together, the flight will be a miserable experience. Uh, Sasha Lazutkin, uh, uh, this was after the Mir Progress collision. Uh, he, he disconnects the wrong cable, and uh, the, the whole po power system for Mir shuts down. They can't, uh, get, they can't uh, get the escape modules to work because of that. I mean, the, the thing, I mean, there was, so, and that was probably a fatigue event. And, and then here, the Russians know only. Here, th this is a tape of uh, Adelantine Lebdev, who wrote Diary of a Cosmonaut. And this is a briefing uh, by one of his psychologists. The Russians know only too well that pairing the wrong crew members could lead to tragedy. In 1982, Russian cosmonaut Vladimir Lebdev sent a message to mission control. If you don't bring us down to Earth now, I'm not going to work with this corpse anymore. After six months in space, Lebdev was prepared to kill his fellow cosmonaut. And Russian mission control talked him out of what could have been the first murder in Earth orbit. And I I, I have an opportunity f because a lot of my friends are, are astronauts and talking about it and I can tell you that there are times when they really do want to kill their crew members, especially the ones that eat their food or get, no I'm serious and, and it, it's interesting but the CO2 levels are now implicated as a factor in increasing irritability in crew members. Okay, so that was Valentin Lebdev. He wrote this great book, Val uh, Diary of a Cosmonaut. Here's Sasha Lazutkin. In the station, in escape pods. So this is after the progress has collided with the mirror. He had already decided to kill himself. One of the cosmonauts, actually, uh, Lazutkin, told me that on the tenth day, he decided to commit suicide because he couldn't stand it already. He went to a remote place in one of the modules. And before uh, suicide, he decided to sleep. The cosmonaut woke up and chose to live. So, I mean, these are things that even in the psychology behavioral health group, they don't always recognize these things as happening. It in this is the uh, Skylab 4. Too many orders from the ground. The crew went on strike. It was a serious breakdown of command and control. A similar strike happened on the Russian Mir station. So, uh, and these are well documented. This was Skylab 4. Jerry Carr talks about it. Uh, you know, it was basically too much work, not enough time to uh, deal with it. And what we learned for, when we went back to long duration missions was that we would give the crew a job jar and they would decide what order to do things. We would give them more control, more autonomy. But it, it, during Skylab 4, which was the 84 day mission, they were pushing and working the crew and, uh, and, and they finally had had enough of it. A uh, similar thing happened on Apollo 7. Um, that's well documented in various books that astronauts read. In fact, it's cool. If you want to, if you're really interested in this, get every book that every, any astronauts read and you can scour it for unbelievably cool stories like this. This is, this is Jerry Leninger. I cut off and stuck with myself that I felt during that time and also how vulnerable I was. And I saw in my crewmates some uh, pretty serious psychological problems developing, people kind of going off the cliff and not able to function at the level I'm sure they wanted to function at. Now, J Jerry Leninger uh, also mutinied. He, he refused to communicate with Mission Control for several weeks because he was always the one that got the crummy compass. So he wanted to talk to his wife and his kids. And they, the Russians kept the good, you know, calm, you know, that wasn't ratty or, ch you know, a lot of static. And so finally Jerry says, if you're not giving me time to talk to my family, I'm not going to talk to you guys. And he just shut up for, for three weeks. Um, anyway, post-flight, you know, we all know about poor Lisa Nowak. We've had uh, uh, suicide and suicide attempt in astronauts. Um, we've had interpersonal conflicts, behavioral change, substance abuse, you name it. Uh, and these are people that are obviously very well screened and psychologically, you know, in the best of shape. God knows what's going to happen when we start seeing, uh, you know, non-professional astronauts fly. In fact, when the latest uh, study was done on the uh, Virgin Galactic group, uh, just getting in the capsule to do a centrifuge run freaked a lot, you know, a, a, over half of them out. That's a, um, that's a picture of a solar eclipse taken from Mir. 
Uh, I, I'm going to have to really go through here because I know Janice wants me to finish up here. No, but take your time, seriously. I'm, like I said, but they're not on the schedule for after the two hours. They're allowed to leave, but they can stay. Around. We don't fly the shuttle anymore, but the shuttle was one of those vehicles that required crew inputs. Uh, the crew flew the vehicle. Uh, uh, once it got below Mach 1, around 100,000 feet, the crew would start flying the vehicles, and they would actually land the vehicles. And, they're, and what, I, what I did when I was involved in the shuttle program was looking at, we were trying to fly the shuttle for 30 days. It was called the Long Duration Orbiter Mission. The Extended Duration Orbiter Mission was up to almost 18 days. But what you see here are two parameters that are essential for landing a vehicle. Every time you fly an aircraft, and you know that pilot just knocked my fillings out, you know, that sucked you know, because you hit too hard, you know, that, that's bad. And it's bad for vehicles because it, you know, can shear the landing gear off. So the vehicle has two parameters that are primarily important on touchdown. One is how fast it touches down, the landing speed on touchdown. You think, hey, that's pretty easy to do, except you don't have an engine. So you can go, you know, you, can, you have to control it by a speed brake and your aircraft and the, and the angle of attack. So ordinarily, you want to target about 205 to 200 knots, plus or minus a little bit, depending on the, the vehicle landing weight. Now what you see here is, uh, this is 200 knots right here. That's where they should be landing. That's the you know, flight rule limit, 214 knots, and that's the 225 is the red limit. That's the landing gear shearing off factor. And then too slow, who are pilots here? Any pilots? Well, you don't like to fly too slow, why? because you stall the vehicle and it slams down too hard, and that gives, creates the second issue, which is the vertical velocity at touchdown. Look at the variability here. These are all test pilots, most of them military test pilots. They've had to have a thousand shuttle training aircraft dives before they can fleet up as commander. This is appalling performance. <laughs> it is. 160 knots? Wow. That's below shuttle, you know, stall speed. And above, two, above 225, that's the sheer landing gear limit off. So, so uh, and it's also related to duration. So longer, pe longer the crew's up, the more, the faster they touch down, and also the harder they hit. So we know, what is this? It's not crew performance, it's, it's, it's a neurovestibular effect on crew. And it's something that we really were concerned about if we went to a 30-day mission and that graph continued to go up like this over here, now you know the average is going to be around 225, which is the landing gear limit. So we were really concerned and we actually ultimately decided not to do a 30-day mission, although the vehicle was rated for it. Vertical velocity at touchdown. You know, you're sitting there, you have your drink in your hand, you know, and you hit down and you you know, as a Navy guy, we would land very hard because that's how you do it on a carrier. And so Navy pilots typically really smack it down. They want to know that they got that vehicle down because they don't have but a couple hundred feet to land in. So ordinarily, the shuttle would not touch down faster than three feet per second. Okay, nice greased on landing. Look at these. This is the flight rule limit, three feet per second. That four and a half feet per second is the, you know, a shear limit. Look at how many, I mean, it's not a lot, but it's still, these are test pilots. Two out of 100 pilots exceeded the structural limit. We had a blown tire, and we had, uh, one of these missions was a very long mission. The, if the vehicle had had any side load, for crosswind load, it would have sheared the landing gear off. We were really lucky. Same thing goes, high speed on touchdown, high vertical velocity on touchdown uh, 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 is correlated with duration. I won't talk too much about spacewalks, although I have a whole, I got two hours of talk on this. I'll just go through this real quick. Huge variability. These are two military aviators, Nancy Curry on the, on the left, or on your right, and Scott Altman, Navy aviator, uh, six foot four, 240 pounds, five foot two, 109, or 100, and, I don't know, 110 pounds. Those are military aviators, and we, that, that's a limit now. We're going to go to 1 to 99 percentile, and it's got huge ramifications f for human factors. Huge number of things have happened in space. I won't, I'll just go through these real quick. Look at all these. EVAs resulting in injury, shoulder problems, uh, EVAs terminated because of crew injuries or cut gloves. We've had uh, several cut gloves. I'll show you some of the problems with that. Forty tool releases. Forty! 
That's a huge number. Those things are, you know, uh, cameras, uh, some of these tools cost millions of dollars. Huge number of, why do f EVA highly trained astronauts drop tools? An hour and a half into the mission, cosmonaut Alexei Leonov floats out of the spacecraft through an inflatable airlock, becoming the first person to walk in space. Leonov stays outside the spacecraft for 12 minutes, but when he tries to re-enter the airlock, he has trouble getting back in because his suit has ballooned. He is forced to deflate the pressure of his suit just enough for him to bend the joints and get back inside. Now, that, that was the first spacewalk, and obviously they learned a lot. Anybody EVA engineers, EVA guys? You know, so you guys probably learned all this. You know, the Russians have two settings on their regulators so they can go to an emergency depress lower. This is, I've got a couple of videos of, of a EVA crew dropping tools, or oh, I guess releasing, the, there, there goes the tool bag. That's, uh, or the camera. That, that was a, a camera that went off in the distance. And then here's uh, Heidi uh, Steffenshire Piper who drops a whole tool bag. She's a Navy diver, so she's used to, and it's like, God. So she's not alone here. People say, oh, you know, women, that's bull, because the majority of tools have been lost by men. Um, but why do experienced crew members lose tools, you know? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a perplexing factor. It might be, you know, they're rushed, they forget to tether, but these are consequences. And if they don't tether themselves, which has happened on one Russian mission, and the crew member was floating off and the other guy grabbed him, you know, he, they, they would be lost in space. That was Jerry Leninger, who was the first U.S. guy that uh, was uh, called and did an EVA in an Orlon uh, spacesuit. And um, what he brought up was this thing about falling, you know, which is not like fear of falling, but it's just this falling sense. It has affected U.S. crew members uh, on the, uh, the, that have to transit out on the arm. And I've had them tell me they had to curl their toes as tight as they could just so they knew they were actually touching st structure. Uh, the Russian Strela crane has a, you know, an, a, 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 a moment to it. It's like a telescoping thing and it's not super stable and the crew members would feel like they're falling and in the U.S. airlock when they would open it up it would be the earth underneath them and crew members sometimes would get stuck going out because it's like a first time skydiver, you know, not wanting to get out of the plane, you know, so they, they learn don't go out head first, go out feet first so, you, you know, you're already halfway out. But there's, you know, it's not, an, it's not a huge issue, but it's, a, it's certainly an issue. And if you go back to this picture here, you know, and you look at that picture there, uh, payload uh, uh, bay transit out to a work site, and the earth's down here, you can bet that guy's holding on for dear life, even though he doesn't have to. Anyway, all right, so where are we here? I want to get finished up here. Oh, here's a cool one. This is a fatigue event. You know, the crew, had, ordinarily, they don't take their boots off, but they took these off and they put them on backwards. Any of you skiers, can you imagine skiing for six hours with your boots on back, the wrong boots? Ow! Uh, a lot of the, MO, the MMOD, I won't talk too much about it, but that's, you know, becoming more and more of a problem. Uh, and those kinds of uh, handrail hits, you know, you see that snag there, and that can certainly tear a glove and cause problems. Um, Gosh, I, I'm, I'm so be far behind, Janet, I'm going to just go through this uh, real quick. Um, the first actual first U.S. space fatality was the X-15 mishap that occurred towards the end of the X-15 program. And I bring that up because it has a lot of relevance to the suborbital community now who are going to be doing, uh, you know, captive carry, air-launched, winged reentry vehicles. Um, this was Mike Adams. He was an experienced Air Force test pilot, his third flight in the X-15. And um, he's doing a payload uh, that has some, some problems. He gets distracted. The vehicle uh, starts to turn sideways during the coast. During the, the, you know, you have the boost phase where your, your engines are firing. Then you have your coast phase where you're, you're in microgravity 
and you're uh, basically not aerodynamic and the vehicle starts to turn, he's working this payload problem, he's not paying attention that the vehicle is turned sideways. He also didn't reset his, his uh, attitude indicator from the payload, uh, which was to primarily to, to focus on roll, to heading, which is what he needed to have configured during, uh, during reentry. So he comes, he, 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 he comes out of the coast phase and starts picking up aerodynamic forces. And by this time, he's, you know, like almost 90 degrees to the velocity vector. One side gets lift and the other side doesn't. And the vehicle goes into a, a Mach 5 uh, flat spin and eventually breaks up. Um, it has to do with payload distracting him, uh, the fact that he didn't configure his attitude indicator from the payload operation to the reentry operation, a lot of human factors there. I even have a video of the breakup, but I'll, I'll go through that quickly. Um, anyway, um, and that he, was, he was awarded his astronaut wings post-humously. Uh, post, uh, 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 um, vehicle reentry issues have caused a lot of problems, particularly during uh, configuration for the uh, reentry phase. Early on in the Russian program, they used a ball or a sphere as, a, as their capsule, and the, consum, uh, consum, uh, the, the service module or consumables module would separate, so you reduce the landing weight. And a lot of times, that separation would not be complete, and so this thing would fall down with it and, and cause the reentry to be very problematic, and this is an artist's rendition of that. This is a shot from the space station of the Soyuz coming in. That's the descent module, and the orbital and service module are burning up, and there you see it burning up completely. The separation of these modules requires precise firing of pyrotechnics to separate the orbital module, where the crew can live in space, the descent module or crew module, which has the heat shield and the couches, and then the consumable module of the service module. Um, the first one that uh, came in uh, off nominally was Soyuz 5. Uh, basically, the uh, orbital module came off, the descent module, and the service module stayed together, and as you see in this picture right here. And so what happened is the center of gravity changed, and so now the vehicle, instead of coming in with the heat shield in the velocity vector, is coming in with the hatch in the velocity vector. So these separation uh, concerns are very real. This was in 1969, early Soyuz program. Has it happened recently? Absolutely. This was TMA-11. This was Peggy Whitson's mission. Okay, uh, Expedition 6. The service module did not separate from the, the uh, descent module like it should have, and it came in backwards or forwards. It came in with the hatch and the velocity vector, and it burned the whole front end off. In fact, uh, the crew surgeon uh, told me, he said they were 10 seconds from penetration of the, of the hatch. And this is the hatch, very badly scored. And also what's around here are two parachutes, which we're lucky that they didn't end up getting burned. That was one of the thruster packs that shows that the burn pattern, here's the hatch, the, 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 shield, the heat shield's on the other end. Um, Another, uh, so the, the, I'll go through several of the fatalities. We had the Soyuz 11, we had the Challenger, uh, and Soyuz 11 was a uh, reentry uh, um, misconfiguration that resulted in a fatality. There were definitely human factors issues involved here, but what happened is the same thing happened. During the pyrotechnic stutters, the pyrotechnics are supposed to fire in a very precise sequence, like say 100 milliseconds apart, so there's not a jolt that goes through there. And apparently the pyrotechnics didn't fire in the right sequence on Soyuz 11. And so what happened is a uh, equalization valve that opens down lower so you can get the hatch open, supposed to open at say 20,000 feet or so, it opened at 400,000 feet. And now the crew are inside and their capsule is depressurizing. It's about the size of a quarter. It's depressurizing slowly. They feel their ears pop. They know something's bad. They have to try to configure the valve to shut it. But it was a stem valve that took like 30 turns and they got halfway through before they finally passed out from lack of oxygen. Now what, what, what went wrong here? They weren't wearing suits. And they weren't wearing suits because the 
Russian program office made a decision, we're going to fly to the space station. This was a Soyuz 1, the very first Russian space station mission, 22 days on orbit. They did a great job. But they could fly two crew with suits or three without. So they made a decision. Hmm, let's don't fly them with suits. Let's fly more crew and have a longer record. So now we'll have, you know, s over 60 days of U Russian, you know, uh, cosmonaut time. And unfortunately, they paid the price because during reentry, that stuttering occurred, causes the equalization valve to open. The crew knows, hey, we can shut that valve off. But they had one, they, they went to the wrong valve and it took too long for them. Meanwhile, the cabin atmosphere is depleted and they pass out from hypoxia and eventually died from exposure to vacuum, which, and actually we went and met with the Russians, talked about it, and got their autopsy information as part of the Columbia investigation. I talked to some of the crew recovery guys there. They said they all had pulses, but all they had available was basic life support, not advanced life support. When I was involved with the Red Bull Stratus project, we developed a treatment protocol for this exposure to vacuum that we could do in the field, and that's now the standard of care. Um, Columbia, uh, this is a, shows the, uh, the analysis of the breakup based on the flight data recorder that was recovered before the vehicle broke apart and the flight data recorder quit working. This is the attitude the vehicle was in. The crew uh, definitely knew they were in a bad situation. The pilot started uh, as part of the loss of control recovery procedure, shut down the APUs and was restarting them uh, when it got to this point here. 46 seconds they were alive and work in the problem and when the, and, and then at, at the end of that time the crew module broke apart in almost identical fashion to the uh, uh, Challenger. At the same point they start to depressurize. Now this time they're in a different position. They have the advanced crew escape suit. Uh, but not everybody had their suit in a configurable position. Um, and uh, uh, two had the helmet off, all of them had their visors up, and three didn't have their gloves on. So if you don't have your suit in a configurable position to survive, it isn't going to help you. And uh, I've talked to a lot of the shuttle commanders, and about probably, two -thir or probably about a third of them didn't wear their gloves because they didn't like the effect it had on the hand controllers. And so there were a lot of lessons learned from this. I know some of the crews after this, particularly Pam Melroy, who was the commander who was also involved on this team, made her crew go through training on, on making sure you put your visor down as soon as possible if you recognized an out of limit situation. Um, this was a picture of an, from an infrared camera taken from a, an Apache helicopter flying at Fort Hood, Texas. And uh, this is the space shuttle main engines and then a time several seconds later D-21 was the crew module, and this breakup occurred, the final breakup was bet between 148 and 138,000 feet, probably Mach 12, but it was in an altitude regime, again, where we, you know, we've seen, uh, you know, ability to potentially survive there. Uh, we had a lot of problems. The helmets were nonconformal, so they created some damage, like, you know, it'd be like wearing a motorcycle helmet that didn't have any padding, so your head would just bounce around inside. The restraint systems didn't work because of the inertial reels, didn't lock up. There were a variety of crew support, life support system issues. Um, I'll just briefly talk about landing. This was Apollo 15. Uh, one of those thrusters fired and cut the parachute riser. Uh, Soyuz, 11, uh, Soyuz 1 was the first Russian mishap in 1967. Vehicle was launched before it was ready. The crew didn't knew that it wasn't going to uh, be able to work right, but they were trying to launch on an anniversary like the Russians do, and they ended up having a, you know, a, a, a big funeral as a result of that. I won't show the video. Um, this is an interesting analysis of it. I went to Russia and spent a lot of time trying to figure out all these different mishaps. They, they were landing a capsule for the first time where the crew was going to be inside and not come out with ejection seats. And so they, they had a lot of problems with the uh, descent systems. Any of you guys descent parachute engineers? So you, you probably know all about all this stuff. But what happened was they, 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 end, they decided at the, towards the end we needed a bigger parachute. So they had to pack a bigger parachute in a smaller container. And they actually, from the stories I heard, they were actually hammering the parachute to get it to fit inside the container parachute container. The other problem they had was when they were doing their final closeout prep, 
they were going to spray an ablative uh, thermal protection system, this kind of black asphalty looking stuff around the outside. They didn't put the hatchback on, they just cut a piece of plywood and sprayed the liner on and it got inside here right around this lip. And, and so you had this really super tight packed parachute and then this friction material that leaked in when they were spraying that liner on. So when the parachute came out, it stuttered. It didn't deploy in the right sequence and so it essentially did what's called a cigar roll, came out and then it fouled with the, main, the reserve parachute and then you saw the, the consequence of that. Um, I won't go through too much. We've had a lot of problems with landings, uh, bounces. This is a, a bounce and you see how the vehicle comes down and, and bounces, uh, you know, particularly in a high wind condition. This was also poor Peggy Whitson's flight. Um, so she comes through upside down and the crew recovery forces are, you know, because it's not in the area they're supposed to come down, they come, they're, they're flying in their helicopters and this is what they see. No big red, big orange parachute and a big fire. There's the capsule right there, right there. The parachute burned up. It didn't burn up because of the heat of the, on anything. It burned up because some farmers were burning the field and they just happened to land in the burning field. <laughs> Uh, a lot of X-15, we had two X-15 mishaps, one because it was, over, uh, it was overweight on landing because they didn't dump enough fuel, and the other, the nose gear failed and it rolled. Here's a Spaceship One doing a ground loop. Um, you don't hear about that? Uh, this is a great story because I always say it ain't over till it's over, you know? Just because you're back on Earth doesn't mean squat, okay? You could land down like the Soyuz 18 where it rolls down the mountain, and almost goes off a cliff, or you can be like Soyuz 23 where they do an emergency undock and they land in this lake and the crew recovery forces are trying to fly to them in this god-awful blizzard and they can't get there so they figured, well, we can't fly in this, it's just, you know, it's impossible. And they thought they had died. They actually were going out the next day after the storm abated and they went out and thought they would find them dead and they were actually alive and they were very cold and pissed off. So it is, <laughs> So it's not over till it's over. Quick summary. Um, space flight risk occurs throughout all the phases of flight, but it's primarily been launch ascent, reentry, landing because of the uh, energy transfers. Um, suborbital flight risk, one about one in 200 based on the X-15 data. Uh, capsule risk, about one in 60, one in 70, and about the same for a winged reentry orbital flight based on the shuttle program and the Soyuz. The hazards in the space environment include the space, the hazards of space flight include the space environment, the vehicle environment, and the mission architecture. The uh, fact is that you can, you can see medical events that occur in even highly screened and selected crews. So you have to have a kind of a posture of how much are you going to be able to take care of them, do you bring them back or not. And obviously that's going to change if you're in deep space, where you might have a 20 minute one way comm delay and no abort options. Uh, our countermeasures, despite the very uh, focused effort, they still don't have the full capability. It's basically like an ambulance plus. Uh, human errors. Like everything in aviation, human errors still contribute to space mishaps, as we've shown in some of these examples. Here's my contact info. I'd welcome your uh, queries, questions, thoughts. And, uh, I don't know if we have time for a few questions, but uh, feel free to contact me. I think I left my business cards over there if you want to get a hold of me. Thanks a lot. I have a question. Are you working with HRP on the long, the one year? Uh, I, I'm working peripherally with them. Some of our scientists are, particularly oh. doing the you know, genetic studies. And I'm looking forward to that mission, you know. That'll be, the Russians have, I think, four people that have flown a one-year missions. And so we have, we need to get more, we need to get some U.S. guys out there. Okay. Oh, that's true. Full, full disclosure, I'm, I actually support the uh, FAA's Office of Commercial Space Transportation. Oh, awesome. So I'm more, I'm more interested in your perspective on commercial activities, if, if you can elaborate on that, especially in light of, history that you just provided about uh, government-run programs and obviously the problems that have arisen in that sector and now looking at commercial companies that are looking to uh, fly tourists. 
I know. I, well, I should give you my. So this was every, This is the thousand ways to die in space. You know, I, I, you have to see my crew survival talk about. And I brief them on that. I talk about well, part of this goes into the informed consent pr prospect of it. But these are he heavily funded government programs, and the U.S. and Russian side still had mishap rates equivalent to a bomber crew in World War II. Wow. Uh, what do you think commercial space is going to have to face? Everybody's talking, well, maybe one in 10,000. Boy, I wish. You know, we'll be lucky if it's one in 1,000. Because right now, it's about one in 100 is, is what we anticipate. But I, I'd be glad to work with you. I work with Ken Davidian and Melkor Antonaro. And, you know, I, 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 my feeling is the more we can share, the more they can learn from the U.S. programs, you know, that have spent 50 years every lesson somehow written and learned the hard way, the better. Um, the good news is a lot of the commercial space companies have NASA, former NASA people, NASA astronauts, who, who can carry on that, that legacy. Um, and I look at the launch failure rates from the early programs of the US and now with, say, uh, Falcon 9, and I go, wow. I mean, we would lose uh, you know, a huge number of, of vehicles uh, in early launch testing, and I, I'm shocked, not in a bad way, but I'm shocked that, that Elon Musk has been able to launch so successfully and make, you know, make milestones. I think that shows the commercial space industry gets it, um, but I'd be happy to share anything I can with you, you all. Can I ask one follow-up? The, the video that has been released of Felix's jump from his spin, is that comparable to Oh, yeah, I, I could do a whole talk on Red Bull. I could show you the video if you want to see it. Um, his spin, you know, the, the reason we did that program was to demonstrate that a human could penetrate the sound barrier in the upper atmosphere. Because when I was on the Columbia, you know, investigation part, there were a lot of guys that go, well, it wouldn't have mattered. They couldn't have survived. Why b bother? Well, that's not my approach. My approach is the kind of the, the Gene Krantz, you know, you never give up. Failure is not an option. You will do everything you can to bring the crew back alive. And what we had to do was to prove that you could survive that. He went into a spin uh, right before he broke the sound barrier. If you want, you guys have time, I could show you the video. It's super cool. It's, you want to see it? Okay. <laughs> this is the technical video that we do not, we do not show this video outside of technical audiences. Now, and you, you guys can save all your questions for, okay, so this is the video. I, I do a two-hour talk on this um, because it's, a, it, it's about, we developed crew survival lessons learned from this, and I am so proud to say that as soon as this program ended, boom, another one started up. So we are already doing a follow-on to this program. Um, what you're going to see here is a fused data system where we took uh, three cameras, the head up on the chest pack, the head up on the right leg, and the head down on the left leg. Airspeed up to 900 miles an hour, altitude. This thing just goes around like a, like a spinning top. This thing goes up to 850 miles an hour. This is the heads up display, mock, and uh, miles per hour, respiratory rate, heart rate, um, the uh, altitude bar, you know, you know, it's a bar like, so you have altitude on one side and, and airspeed on the other. So that's, a, that's at 127,000 feet. And then altitude versus time, g-force versus time, that's the opening shock, that's the landing, and that's the spin. And then this is the speed versus time with the 30 seconds in, in uh, supersonic. The three-axis accelerometer, and then this is the resultant G vector. So here he's standing on the step. So it's like essentially his one G down with the blood column. So what you're going to see is a lot of stuff going on here. Um, and uh, we, we do, in fact, we've, we briefed uh, all the commercial companies, the FAA and NASA on this. And all the data is available, too. So for groups that want to look at the physics of it, there's been quite a number of articles that are written, and we've got two modeling programs that have been done on this that are, that are in the process of being published. So what you're going to see here is he does his hand salute. He starts the uh, high-speed cameras that are above him uh, with a little red button, 
and uh, you'll see him step off and you'll notice that very quickly once he's in free fall he's in zero G just like he's in parabolic flight he's basically in parabolic flight for 25 seconds you see the airspeed 200 time up here 12 seconds he's now at Mach 5 I mean Mach 0.5 uh, heart rate and respiratory rate stay up 180, uh, 160, 180. I've got all the data too if you want this. Uh, I can email you or send you hard copies. Okay, now he, right, right about now he's, at, uh, he's right at Mach 1, right at that point. You can see this little uh, graph over here. He's head down in a, in a, a right uh, aileron roll. He's at Mach 1. Uh, 1.25. Now you see the column of blood moving up to his head as he's in that head down spin. Um, the worst part of the spin, okay, so, he, and he's, he's in the inverted spin for about and now he, he just recovered. So he was in the inverted spin that was dangerous with a headward fluid shift of about two and a half G's for about 13 to 15 seconds. Very tolerable. We would do spin training to get, build that tolerance. Uh, acrobatic pilots are used to that all the time. Um, and if you want, I can come back and give a talk on this too because I have like a thousand different <laughs> slides. Anyway, um, this is not, a, this is not a, anywhere close to a, a fatal problem. Okay, we were... Yeah, it, it looked worse than it was, but he was, he said I was, he was, said he was really dizzy. Uh, some people would get motion sick or, you know, nauseated from that. Um, it's, all, it's a big concern. And I could show you some of our other dummy drops where the spin rate was all, unbelievably bad. There are escape systems in, in development for several commercial space companies. Yes. Sorry, I know everybody wants to get out of here. Oh yeah, yeah. Now l let me tell you though, this was in free fall without a drug shoot. Our feeling is you use a drug shoot. And all the follow-on tests that Joe Kittinger said at the end of this, he said, what we learned was the same thing we learned in 1960 is don't do this without a drug shoot. So the follow-on stuff is drug is a drug shoot, and it cuts the spin down to nothing. Uh, yeah, you, you know, um, th that's a. Th he was phenomenal. He he was, and he, you know, I think with some of it psychological, some of it is physio physical. You you can do spin adaptiveness in uh, acrobatic pilots, including many women pilots, will do this all. They'll go up and they'll do outside loops and they'll do uh, aileron rolls where they're getting a headward and feetward uh, shift, just like we got. Um, so this is something that. Uh, an average fit person, and certainly the the the, comp the astronaut uh, population is in that category. Whether a, com a a commercial space tourist would be, I don't know. But the drogue shoot, the drogue shoot that we are using now cuts the spin out, so you don't have that that problem. That's why we did the follow-on program. How do you know it's a well, it's a secret, but you, you <laughs> well, don't don't now. don't put it on Facebook. <laughs> okay. If you have further questions, I can, you know, you can email me. All right, well, thanks so much for your attention. Thanks. See you. Yeah.